Welcome to this week's episode of Safety Culture Solutions, brought to you by Safety Culture Strategies. I'm Mike Kinney, your host. Today, we have the pleasure of having Larry Wilson with us. And early in his career, Larry Wilson, founder and chief visionary officer and co-CEO of Safe Start International, was working as a behavior-based or BBS consultant. Through his training class with thousands of workers, Larry realized states like rushing, frustration, fatigue, and placency, much more than lack of knowledge, contributed to human errors. We'll continue to explore the role of his states and the errors in these classes and the on-the-jobs observations. He confirmed the now familiar four states lead to four errors, which increases the risk of injury pattern. Larry used his vast experience as a safety consultant to develop the four CERTs, critical error reduction techniques to reduce risk by combating the state to error pattern. Collectively, this led to the formation of the world run out Safe Start International Training Program. He has worked with over 2,500 companies in Canada, the U.S., Mexico, South Africa, Africa, South America, the Pacific Rim, and Europe. And he's also the author of Safe Start, an advanced safety awareness program currently being utilized by more, over 2 million people in 50 countries worldwide. Larry has spoken at thousands of conferences, workplaces, and trade shows in three continents. Examples include ASSP and NSC and the VBPA National Conference. Larry, welcome aboard. It's great to have you on the show with us. How are you doing today, brother? Oh, Mike, thank you so much, first of all, for having me. And yeah. everybody, I, Mike and I go back to like the <laughs> beginning of this, the safe start. And uh, um, it was, uh, you know, we was... Uh, my hair is a bit shorter now, but Mike is the only person in the room who maybe have hair longer than me. <laughs> I think we did back then. And um, it, it was also back then, too, like to, to even be talking about yeah. human error was the kin to heresy, right? So it was yes. always, it was always like, Mike, to see you sitting there at the, you know, at the front going, well, at least there's one person I know here who's you know, willing to at least, you know, open the open the horizon a bit you know think beyond the box you know i always wondered mike whether there'd be more than you and me at the center <laughs> sometimes and uh, you know thankfully like you were saying people uh you know it, pe people did start coming around but i was actually thinking it was 20 years ago today wow, really ohs magazine released the second article that i i published in defense of all this called the dumb worker a new perspective yeah and it's, right. it's interesting because i'm now going to re-release this article part two with a lot of what you were saying about the the performance errors part yeah. at, at the end going you know this the hypocrisy like okay here's here's the sad truth you start counting the number of errors you make every day even if it's <laughs> only two or three or four Huge. or five an hour just think of texting that's over 50 a day, yes. so hundreds a week, right? So as a manager, if I'm looking at you <laughs> as a worker and I'm saying, you know, Mike, you're making 150 <laughs> mistakes a day, I mean, 150 mistakes a week or whatever it is, no. and I'm only making 153. <laughs> you know, you can say, well, yeah, he's just a factory worker, but the reality yeah. is you're only three better, and that's just this week. So next week, you'll probably be worse. So the whole idea that no matter who you are or where you are, you don't make any mistakes or you don't make any serious mistakes is really just so unfounded in reality, right? And yet, you know, all of that and the perspective and everything else, it, it, takes, it takes a long, it does take a long time. I mean. I don't know if you you remember 1988 at the ASS, it was the ASSE back then, and Dan Peterson said, he said, you know, if one of our leading universities invented a safety vaccine <laughs> that eradicated injuries or eliminated injuries 50%, he said it would still take our profession 20 years to implement it. And we all kind of laughed, you know, and Dan, you know, because Dan was the man and everything yes, like yes, that. Yes, yes, you know, absolutely. And, and 20 years after, like, we released Safe Star, I'm going, 20 years. That's what you told me, Dan. <laughs> well, you know, 
Yeah, real you're quick, actually, Larry, but before we get into our question, I, I love that you're, yeah. you're going to re-release your article on the Dumb Worker Revisited, one of my pet peeves, and I'll share it with everybody. And just like you, a lot of us will use LinkedIn as, as a, a way to professionally connect. Uh, so somebody decided to call in and say howdy. So one of the things I've noticed is different safety professionals with the best of intentions, they'll share a video of somebody tripping or handling a tool inappropriately, and you'll see this string of comments. How can anybody be that stupid? What a dumb worker. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and that just, you know, that sets my hair on fire, which is a lot. But it's to me, so here's a safety professional that with the best of intentions, I don't think's really got it yet. We're going to have a couple of topics we're going to talk about. And after we come back from break, all the viewers don't go far away because we're going to be also discussing some new techniques Larry and his team have come up with to enhance quality, reduce attrition, get profitability, efficiency, and the fun stuff. So Larry, being as how you've done this once or twice, when we have some C-suite people who like to listen in and view what's going on. So if you had to pick one key attribute for a positive safety culture, what do you think that'd be? Um, that is a really, really good question. I mean, the, as long as you and I have been going to all of these things, Mike, um, 30 years, everybody, or more, we don't need to go how much more, but um, people have been talking and selling safety culture. They've been primarily measuring it with perception surveys yeah. and things like that. Um, which, which can be genuine and can, be, can be unbelievably manipulative too, in terms of if you've got a supervisory training program, you can build a survey so the gap looks like that's where your gap is at the supervisors. But anyhow, um, I would say um, when I go into a place, it, it, this is gonna sound so old school analog, you can feel a culture. You can cool. feel whether it's real, whether it's happening, whether the people care. Now you can ask, you can ask some basic questions, and depending on how people answer, obviously you can get some pretty easy, easy things to. You know, you ask twenty-five people out of twenty-five, would you feel comfortable about reporting an injury? And all twenty-five of look at you like, are you well? Like, you know, unless I couldn't walk out of this place, I would never report an injury. And then you tell the manager, and they say, oh, everybody here reports every injury they have. And you go, okay, so, you know, no huge gap in reality would be the number one thing I would suggest you could measure a culture with. In other words, do the managers and the employees really think the same way? And do they think the other guys think the same way? And do they all think they're on the same team? And if you've got that, then probably the other things will likely fall into place in terms of reporting in real time, people getting at things in real time, you know, looking at how fast things get closed out from when they get reported. You know, I mean, you can, you, you can certainly you can certainly get the uh, you know the 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 gist of it all, but it isn't until you really get to talk with the people and the managers, Mike, that you get to find out is it all real or not, right? That's now, exactly correct. You know, there's there's two things that I found, unfortunately, and that is that I've had the pleasure of working with some really really committed senior managers, mm -hmm. and almost every one of them, somebody died on their shift somewhere along the way. Sad, but true. And then the other guys, the only way you can get to being a senior executive, you, these days you can't be against safety. I mean, it's political yeah. suicide. So the only way you can get there, if you're not genuinely committed, is if you have learned how to play dodgeball incredibly well. Or as Alex Carnival, he's, this, he's the CEO and president of Dynacast now. Yeah, but he's, he's been on a lot of the expert panels and he's been on my uh, the Larry Wilson live show as well, too. And he talks about the, the slippery manager, Larry. Oh, the <laughs> slippery manager. Oh, he said we could write a book about the slippery manager. The slippery manager. I love it. Slippery manager. And this is the other thing, too, you've got to understand is that people like people like get good with, you know, excuses have a kind of evolutionary component mm -hmm. to it. Excuses that don't work die a miserable death, so you don't use them again. 
So, like, you're not going to tell your manager that the Martians stole your PowerPoint, you know, or your report. You might have told your grade school teacher that. But I did it for production. Yeah. Oh, Mike, that one works really well. Yeah. And that's why so many people use it, right? And if you start hearing it enough, then you start believing that these supervisors must be whipping these guys like galley slaves. And then you go out and you talk to the supervisors, and most of these guys are actually really decent guys, yes. but they got their hands full just trying to keep everything together. And so you figure it must be the middle manager guys who are really evil, and those guys are even better. And then you get to the top guy, and you figure he must be like the emperor in Star Wars or something. <laughs> and it turns out that this guy never wants to go to a funeral ever. Right. And he's pretty serious, or she's pretty serious about it all. And I keep looking for all these evil people, and I'm going, yeah. well, where are they all? Right. Right. And then I was walking out to the car. I realized I didn't have my phone. And so I ran back into the house to get it. And that was when I noticed that I was running back into the house to make up the time for the error that the time just wasted, even go. though I wasn't late for anything. And I started going, oh my God, that's, you're not, your yeah. error has put the job behind the inclination to rush, to yes. run back to the tool yes. crib to get the right weld rods. I mean, and so you didn't see the piece of paper on the floor, you slip, you break your arm, it's going to be the piece of paper's fault. <laughs> but the thing, well, you know it is. You know it is. Or the oil or whatever it was there, right? You know. Yeah. But, I mean, but if Buddy just tripped over his own feet, which I do a fair bit, um, in there. you know, the reason I'm rushing was for production, right? And yes. so, you know, it, it, it's if you kind of get to the root cause, which is what's causing you know, what, what's causing the rushing and then also learning that learning how to react to it so that it doesn't make the situation worse. You know, all, all of that stuff is, is really important for people to get into the culture so that it doesn't become a culture of blame, too, because that's just, you know, almost guaranteed to get you nowhere. Exactly. One thing I always liked about being around you, having the pleasure, being in your booth and talking to other people is that the, the senior management, they need to recognize this potential for human error because it you know, occurs all the time. So to me, then they have to have an error, a human error tolerant system, which includes how they respond when that human error is realized. And just like you're saying, yeah. you know, if it becomes the blame game, you know, how could you have been that stupid? What were you thinking? Don't you realize how important this job is? You know, you're probably not cultivating the best atmosphere. So that kind of nice little segue to another topic. So from your perspective as a senior leader, as the president, like the ones you were talking about, what's some critical skills they need to make sure that they have available to them to reinforce that positive safety culture? Well, the, you know, when you were talking about the safety folks, Mike, and, you know, like they'll post a clip and say, can you yeah. believe somebody was that dumb? Well, I've also seen it the other way at a, at a big safety conference, uh, Gas Oil Consortium in India. And um, they were talking about an isopropyl plant that blew up on startup because they were in a rush. They didn't do all of the appropriate checks. And these guys, the safety <laughs> folks, we're ready to hang that plant manager that blew the place up. Although I, I'm not sure he survived the whole thing either. Um, but anyway, they were ready to hang him from the highest tree. And I said, guys, did anybody like think about the reality? Like this guy did not get to be in charge of a billion dollars of assets because he's a fool. Nobody puts a fool in charge of a billion dollars worth of assets. That doesn't mean he couldn't have made a very bad decision that day. What was going on that day with him? And do any of these senior managers ever get more than an, an overview session on the training you'll be providing for their, like it's as, or, it's as if, you know, you guys are above all of this because <laughs> your position is demigod in the organization so you know you're not susceptible to rushing frustration fatigue complacency like that's just ridiculous good, but good i point. mean 
Well, no, we've done, I mean, 10 hours of training for a huge chemical company in North America. I got 90 minutes, like 15,000 of their employees, 16,000 of their employees. I got 90 minutes with their executives. Wow. So, you know, they got a chance to dip the toe in the water mm -hmm. and then they can tell everybody they know how to swim. Well, <laughs> <guess what? laughs> yeah, I, if I were you, I'd stay a little out of the canoe. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is a good place. We're going to take a, a commercial break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned because you're going to learn some amazing techniques to help quality and productivity. Stand by. We'll be right back. Safety Culture Solutions. Safety Culture Strategies provides world-class safety culture and safety program management consultative services for clients throughout the United States. Whether your company is pursuing Voluntary Protection Program STAR designation, ISO 45001 certification, or considering a comprehensive review of your current safety programs and processes, Safety Culture Strategies brings hands-on experience combined with a unique perspective that readily translates from senior management to task level personnel. This collective skill set provides you with a very insightful health check of your overall safety management system that can also assist with reducing injuries and attrition as well as increasing profitability. Safety Culture Strategies is also certified to provide Ziegler Institute employee engagement training and leadership coaching. When combined with established relationships with federal and state regulators, Safety Culture Strategies is unique positioned to assist the safety culture efforts of any company. For additional information, visit www.scstrat.com or call us at 702-780-1410. After all, every company has a safety culture, but is it the culture you want? And we're back. We've got Larry Wilson with Safe Start International. And one of the things that fascinates me, what Larry and his team does, they're not one of these guys, okay, we're going to do the same thing we've done for the last 50 years. Here's the, the PowerPoints. We may or may not update them. You continue to push the envelope, recognizing just the benefit of this process. And we need to talk quickly about safe track and safe start performance. Because Larry, as I understand it, because I view this as really cutting edge stuff. Now you're talking about just efficiency and quality and reduced attrition, all the things that any senior manager, I know they're, you're gonna perk their attention. Can you give me a little bit insight now that I cued you up? Oh, well, sure. Um, the, uh, well, um, I can give you right back I, to the beginning. I'm doing a, a PR visit at a, a uh, Procter and Gamble site in, in Brockville, Ontario. Um, our, uh, there's another Procter and Gamble site in Belleville, Ontario. And I, I'm sure most of you all around the world, you know, you know, New York, Las Vegas, you know, Belleville, Brockville, it's all the same. Um, but uh, not the big smoke, but 600 and some odd people. And um, the last interview of the day is with the plant manager. And I go into his office and then he gets up and he closes the door and I'm like, oh gosh, what am I doing wrong now, right? You know, because, and I, I, and he said, uh, he said, no, no, I'm just not sure. I want everybody to hear this, Larry. He said, um, he, he said, when I got out of university, um, my first five years as an engineer, I worked for your mother when she was a quality control manager of Dolores Stella. And so he said, I feel a bit of, you know, advantage because like, you don't really know who I am at all, and I know lots about you. But he said, I got to ask you, he said, why safety? And I said, what do you mean? And he uh -huh. said, well, like, he said, you got gold and silver and zinc in this mine, and you decided to mine the zinc. He said, like, we've had a 70% decrease in unscheduled downtime. We're the number one plant in Procter and Gamble for operating efficiency. I mean, we haven't had a lost time recordable injury in, you know, however long, you know, 18 months or something. He said, but, you know, there's lots of plants that do that. He said, like, why, 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 why the safety? And I'm like, you know, well, because I was in the zinc business. A lot of people knew me in the zinc business. And 
What I was trying to do at the beginning, Mike, you know this, I was trying to plug the hole in traditional behavior-based sure. safety because yes. it didn't, all the observations in the world really didn't help much with human error. I could watch you walk down the stairs last month, you were fine. Last week, you were fine. Yesterday, you were fine. I don't know why you fell today. <laughs> now, you probably, you probably know. You probably but know. It's not me and my observation, my positive reinforcement, and thanks for holding the handrail, Mikey. You know, I mean, okay, you know, it's better than nothing, but it's not necessarily going to prevent you pulling your phone out, running down the stairs when you're in a rush or whatever it is, right? Right. So the human error part wasn't really something that lent itself well to outside in. It was much more something where you had to get people to recognize the, like, you know when you're tired and you know when you're too tired. I don't know. Yeah. You've got to make you've got to be the one who makes that call, right? And you can say, and quite often it's true, that the company's causing the fatigue, but it's not like that's the only fatigue in the world, you know, and you're driving home at night. I mean, I, I had Alistair McCubbin and, and Alex both say this. The thing about it is, you are where you are at the moment. Yes. Whether that's where you should be, whether those hazards should be there, whether you should be driving tired or not, isn't the issue. You are where you are. Or the way I used to put it, you shouldn't be in the water in the first place. But if you are, <laughs> if it's you much are. better you know how to swim, right? Yes. Like, yes. Don't, don't politicize whether there should have been a guardrail or there should have been a life jacket. We're just trying to focus in on this part here. Hopefully, you've got a guardrail or front end engineering to eliminate the hazards wherever you can. Sure. And hopefully you've got whatever redundancy fail safe measures so that if there is an error, like a loss of balance, traction or grip, then it will fall mm -hmm. to their death, right? Exactly. But that's not going to prevent the falls on the concrete. And when you're at the same level or the stairways and a lot of the other, a lot of the other stuff, you know, and I hear, I hear people like, you know, deep water horizon got so much press and, Everybody was saying, you know, well, they had great personal safety, but perhaps, you know, they shouldn't have spent so much time worrying about slips and falls and they should have spent more time worrying about the place blowing up. But you and I both know perfectly well that if in the first three months of operation, somebody slipped and fell and died, there would have been a huge hue and cry about all of that as well, too. Right. right. So exactly. whenever exactly. something bad happens. It's not like people don't go out like looking for a witch to burn. They yeah. do, you know, and yeah. that whole part's got to stop because it doesn't, it's not getting anybody anywhere, right? Like, exactly. you know, they, like you can say whatever, like you can blame people for human error, but it doesn't prevent the next one. And real quick on Deepwater Horizon, Larry, you know, because I've had the pleasure, I've talked a lot about it with different organizations, just on overall culture. And Deepwater, it was millions of dollars over budget and 60, 90 days behind schedule. So what was the true infamous from the senior management team? And yeah, they were measuring, yeah. you know, having a lid on your coffee cup, which is nothing wrong with that, but how they... What they chose to emphasize is what people commonly respond to. One thing, a couple more things we're going to touch on before we get out of here. Who has from, who has helped you the most when you reflect back? What mentor back in the day really kind of calibrated you for your amazing trajectory of your career? Other than you being there, and then it was, <laughs> hey, uh, no, that was a big part of it, man. I, I really, I, I hopefully everybody's getting that. Um, mm, too kind. The um, well, they, you know, I also wanted to sort of go back to the other the other point you're making too about the quality as well too. Like you, this is really simple. Okay, we all know that nobody is ever trying to get seriously hurt, and you know, I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. Now, do you really think anybody is trying to make a serious quality error or a serious production error ever? Good point. I mean, really, you know, like, I mean, but we all do, right? So, you know, if you look at all of it and you say, okay, so line of fire and balance traction grip are just subsets of those performance errors caused by rock and frustration, fatigue, yes. complacency. And whenever you're moving or things are moving around you, line of fire and balance traction grip are always in play. 
Yes. But usually there's the potential for wasting time, wasting money, or damaging relationships as well, too, right? So if you think about instead of one risk triangle, think about four risk triangles in terms you could have a potential for every error, you could eyes and mind not on task, you could have a potential quality error, production error, time wasting or customer relations error, or if you're moving or you're moving around safety and you don't get to choose which of those <laughs> you get to end up in and sometimes like a car wreck you end up in all four right because right. it's time money customer relations and you got hurt so that part i think if i had have made it much more holistic at the beginning Good point. it probably would have been better because it wouldn't have been so siloed but like I said, I was kind of in the zinc business, and I was trying yeah. to plug all. And what's and, fasc- uh, what's fascinating for all the viewers, you've heard the phrase now a couple of times: customer relations. And every organization out there, you have some version. Of, I choose to call them a stakeholder. Maybe that's that customer buying it. Maybe it's the rep you have to deal with to get your products. So using Larry's strategy from you know Safe Start International, if you can enhance customer relations along with everything else. You know, I got to say, boss, that kind of sounds like a winner. Well, the thing is, is that if you start asking people, do you really think it's hazards or human error? A lot of people are so oriented to hazards, the law and everything. But if you go, okay, 97 to 99% of the time, it's a hazard and an error because nobody's ever trying to get hurt. So if you work on the air, a lot of the other performance things are going to improve too because you're not trying to screw up ever right <laughs> it's, we, we do right you know and it's it's and it, it, like i think people go you know well so you know i drop my car keys what's the big deal i'm going yeah well when you drop your phone sometimes the screen cracks though see like that's the <laughs> idea like I, don't tell me you were trying to drop your car keys in the first place because you weren't so you know i think Perfect. a lot of it also has to do with people accepting that we all got really much better with the excuses, the diminishing and the deflecting. Wow. Can you imagine yeah. if we had spent the same amount of time analyzing and improving? Beautiful. Like in Beautiful. other words, you know, like instead of learning how to make better excuses, if we had to just learn how to get better at not screwing up in the first place, right? And that actually if you've got kids or you've had kids, you can actually watch the quality of their excuses get better <laughs> until pretty soon. They're giving excuses that are just as good as the ones you're giving, but none of them prevent the next one. Not one of them prevents the next one. And that part, exactly. I think, exactly. you got to get your head around no exactly. matter who you are in the organization, right? right. And, and I think part of you're right on target. So when People in an organization, when they are confident, they'll say, Larry, guess what? This is you know, Mikey, the dumb old white-haired safety culture guy. I really screwed up. It's on me, nobody else. I have to have a lot of trust. If, if you're my direct report or the ultimate boss I'm reporting to, that I'm not going to get you know, skinned alive over this. So again, a lot of this goes back to that trust in the organization, just wow. how confident people feel that if they own the error, right, that it's not going to blow back on them tenfold. Well, Mike, let me take it. You always said, about your, come, I'll hear something new. Okay, now take that <laughs> one step further and go, okay, but you don't screw up all the time because that's why nobody gave you the job. Right. So why was it this time? And now you go and you look for rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency, or combination of them. And you realize, okay, I was in a rush and I was a little tired and I hadn't made this mistake in five years. Okay, so that's why I did it. Now I know what to do about it, you know, which critical error reduction techniques to work on for which states, right? So I've actually got something to do. But instead of now your boss going, well, you know, all I count is yes, no, Mike makes too many mistakes, <laughs> mistakes, Mike's out the door. That's what they do, okay? Yes. That's what it is. Your your rap sheet on error is all the all omnipotent. Like buddy, buddy, buddy backs the fork truck off the loading dock, um, and there's gonna be a big investigation, root cause, mm-hmm. everything like that. It'll be done properly. Okay. He just ships three transport truckloads, 150 skids to their second best customer instead of their best customer, mm-hmm. what's going to happen is they're going to say, how many times has Billy done this in the last couple of years? Yeah. 
It isn't going to be root cause like we, so they don't even take the safety learnings over into the significant air and mm -hmm. say, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe we ought to start color coding some of these things because these, these barcodes aren't the easiest things to read when the light's not good, you know, whatever you, you want to do. You know, like that, it's, it's a bit sad that when it comes to human error, your rap sheet is likely going to dictate a lot more than what we could learn from an investigation yes. or what we could learn from an analyzing and improving, right? And so no wonder everybody gets good at the <laughs> deflection, because otherwise you get fired, you get right? Fired. Okay, okay, real quick, before we get out of here, you're speaking in front of a large group of people, and you've done that, as I noted, a whole pile of times. My granddaddy would say, you've got the C-suite people there. You've got the senior safety people there, the directors and, and a lot of the, the practitioners of safety, if you will. So you, you've done your great 45 minutes as usual, standing ovation. Everybody's hollering, wanting your autograph. When you go to step away, what's two or three things you want to leave with them that hopefully they write down and take back? To their work environment well that 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 the human error is universal and Perfect. that you know, blaming the blaming the people or singling them out or even looking down your nose at somebody else is just the epitome of hypocrisy and it's certainly not going to prevent the next error you make okay so that that whole idea that we're all on a journey and nobody's there yet would be something i'd really like them to take away with and of course, if you've ever heard me speak in public, I would like you to take this stuff home to your families and by all means, take the videos and the movies and the things that I've made to any youth group, school group, whatever you want, because I think you probably all are very well aware of the graph, you know, the SIFs haven't yep. come down, the reportable entries have, okay. Uh, I've looked at over 500 fatal injury reports, Mike, and over 90% of those people that gets dreary reading, don't do more than 20 a day. Right. But, yeah. but 92% of the people work for companies with about 10 employees. Wow. Really? These aren't big crews. Yeah, so they aren't They're big the organizations. They come and clean your eavesdrops and they fall off the ladder and hit their head. They, they're doing like limb trim, trim removal and they fall on the sidewalk, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, single proprietor, like the, you know, the guy in one helper, 71 year old farmhand. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a whole, like, so the, for all the people that are at the conferences that are watching those talks, that, that's not who's dying. Right. Good point. So Very if good point. we don't get this stuff into the trade schools and we don't get it into the next Very generation, good. that graph is going to stay the same. It's going to stay the and same. And I think, I think mean, I'm not against the recordables getting to a really low level and all the sprains and strains and the nicks and bruises and so on. I think everybody, you know, but the real thing is the serious injuries and fatalities, right? That's what, you know, we know some of them, not all of them are caused by exactly the same thing. So, you know, you get, again, you don't get to be selective, right? And there's a certain amount of, you know, validity and focusing on the stuff that, could likely be the most bad for sure. You got it. But okay. okay. We're not focusing. Yeah. We're not focusing on the companies where the bad stuff is going to happen. And until you do that, it's never going to change much of this. That's all. And fortunately, yeah, it's not going to change much. So in listening to all this, and I always like to have the takeaways for the people listening, and Larry, you and I can chat at after we go off the show. It, you can feel the culture of an organization when you walk in, and people rec need to recognize there's this long-term journey to recognizing what human error is and what it is not, and making sure, candidly, that your companies have ways to accommodate it. Before we let you go on the screen, Larry, how do people get a hold of you, buddy? Um, Larry, Larry at safestart.com is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me or um, Western time zone, Pacific time zone, if you wanted to give me a shout on the phone. But um, um, and I'm also on LinkedIn and uh, and I think that would probably be it. Larry at safestart.com or on LinkedIn might be the easiest. 
Perfect. Hang on, Larry. I'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that concludes this week's episode of Safety Culture Solutions. It's brought to, brought to you by Safety Culture Strategies. I'm Mike Kenny. You can reach me at mike at scstrat.com. Office number 702-780-1410. The website, www.scstrat.com. And the tagline I coined a long time ago, and I will stand beside it. Every company has a culture, but is it the culture you want? Till next week, have, enjoy your safety culture journey. Thank you for your time.